David Attenborough joined the BBC in 1952 and left in 1972 after his time as controller of BBC Two and director of programmes. At the age of 96, he's still making documentaries, and the day before I recorded this, he'd been filming. I started by asking him how he joined the BBC in the first place as a zoology graduate. I'd got a, a, a degree at, in, in university in, in Cambridge, and I spent two years in the Navy. Uh, I decided I didn't want to be a professional scientist, which seemed to me a bit limiting. <laughs> That's an excuse, really, because I, was, I don't think I was really up to it intellectually. But anyway, I, I didn't, um, and I didn't know what to do, and I thought I wanted to be in... I thought publishing would be nice. Mm -hmm. I tried to get into publishing. I uh, found myself in the educational branch of, uh, of Hodder and Stoughton, which was a big publishing group at the time, um, and I worked for that for a couple of years, and that was inexpressibly boring. And I thought, what else could I do? And uh, being a young city gent at the time, that means I read the Times. I used to travel <laughs> up on the tube and <laughs> read the Times. And there was an advertisement in the Times for a sound radio producer on the BBC. I thought, well, I can... A talks producer, actually. And I thought, well, I can produce talks. I can, why not? And I applied for a job... Um, as it requested, and, and I got a, a turn down, uh, saying I wasn't successful after about a fortnight. And I thought, well, that was that. And then a few days after that, I got a, a, another telephone call from someone who said, my name is Mary Adams. I work for a new organisation called BBC Television. Uh, we're looking for, looking for to persuade people to come. Persuade people to mm. come. Uh, and we think there's quite a lot of people are rude about television, but I, I think it's quite interesting. And would you be interested? And so I said, yes. I went up to Alexandra Palace, she had an interview with her, and she told me what it was all about. And <laughs> it ended by saying, she said, I'm awfully sorry, but I'm afraid um, we can only take you on for, for three months as a trainee. And we can only pay you a th a £1,000, no, twice as much as I got paid to be in publishing. I thought I'd take a risk. There's no guarantee of a job. Can I just stop you there? Now, in those days, radio was the senior service. Very much so. And people looked down on television. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, especially the television, and no more, no more so than people in, in broadcasting house and sound radio. Mm. The, the licence fee was a piffling amount. I mean, we only had a few hundred, tens of thousands of viewers. And, uh, so, in fact, the, the sound radio licence paid for us, for television. And we were uh, given money from Broadcasting House by controller of finance. And the money that we got was sound radio money, of course, largely. So you were at Alexandra Palace. Now, as, as I remember, in those very early days, just after the war, reasonably close to the war, they still had the same electronic cameras that they had before the war. Oh, they were the same pieces of equipment. They weren't, I mean, they were the actual things. Um, and they were emitrons, um, and they were mounted on bicycle wheels. And another one, which was called Iron Man, which was a, a central pillar on three wheels, which could be pushed about. But the, the camera one, which was on bicycle wheels, was, uh, was mobile, so that you could actually move in vision, which was quite exciting. But they only had um, a single lens, one single lens, so... Uh, if you wanted to have one that was going to be a, a close-up lens, you had to specify that before you started the production. Because changing lenses were, meant that you had to withdraw the camera from operation, take off the front, fit a new thing altogether, and then go in. So you couldn't do it during a production unless you were going to lose the camera for 10 minutes. And how many, how many cameras would you have Three. in this studio? Yeah, I mean, we were very luxurious to have four. And they, were, and they constantly broke down, actually, during, during broadcasts, so that uh, you would be in the control gallery looking, and suddenly the picture on the monitor, which came from, say, camera two, uh, would disappear, and you would look through the glass window of the control room, and you could see that people in brown coats were taking off the camera. This was during transmission, and putting in new valves, new racks of valves. It, it was fairly primitive. I noticed that you had a, a presenter credit in 1953 with animal vegetable and mineral, I think. I, I never appeared in Animal Vegetable and Mineral. No, I was an assistant producer. So you were directing and beginning to produce things? No, there was very little difference between producers and directors then. 
you might have, well, you have a secretary because when you were directing from the gallery, you would have someone who was keeping check on what was happening on some of the monitors and so on. And and they were they were terrific. I mean, the production secretary was the creme de la creme. I mean, and very very able women, who um, and lots of us. <laughs> Uh, producers and directors particularly new at the game. I mean, simply uh, because it was all live, there was, all programmes were live, uh, it would suddenly blew your top during transmission and they would, they would take over and, and they'd say, oh, on camera three, come into camera one, cut to camera one, for, there was a monitor for each camera right. and a monitor for the output. And you had to go, announce to, your, to the, sen, the STALI, the senior television engineer, you had to tell him what the camera you wanted to come to next. And you couldn't cut to it until he had put it up on the preview to say that, from an electronic engineering point of view, it was an acceptable picture. And then the, you get a nod from the, from the SLE and they say, cut camera one. And, and she would do it physically. Yes. The, the production secretary yes. would do it physically. So they were the vision mixers vision in those mixers, days. Yes. Yes. I mean, we actually, <laughs> we did short stories. A short story consisted of a chap sitting in a coachman's chair or an armchair, reading, because we didn't have teleprompters, reading a script, and you'd start it on camera one, which would be quite a long way from, I what, what, I don't know, five yards, six yards, seven yards, that sort of thing, away from him. And you would do what they call a slow trickle. And, and he would be moving imperceptibly in, little by little, until you eventually got to the end, which was presumably the the sort of punchline of the story. And then by that time you would be in close-up. But you could do the whole programme on one camera. And what sort of transmission times were you given in those days? Well, we were broadcast about three hours a night. Yes, about that. I mean, we went... There were, there were the programmes in the morning, I think, for children. Yeah. And then it was thought that, um, that the... Housewives, women of the world, of Great Britain, all went to cook lunch with their husbands, presumably, um, and then you, so that you stopped broadcasting, and then you came back on, on the air for afternoon for a short period, and then you stopped again, and then you you went on in the evening, and the number of hours that you were on air was limited by government edict. The corporation was not allowed to broadcast in excess of a certain number of hours. Why, you may ask? Well, because if you did more than that, there would be a case for putting up the licence fee, and, and they wouldn't accept that. It was a separate television licence fee. Tell me about animal, vegetable and mineral, because that went on for many years, didn't it? It was what I was engaged to do to start with. Um, I joined it on the second out programme. One programme had already gone out. Uh, it was a quiz uh, in which me museums were challenged to produce a mysterious objects for, ex for experts to identify. And of course, it wasn't really a quiz, but it was one you know, way to get informed archaeologists and, and so on, historians, uh, artists, uh, to talk about something, how they knew it was a certain date or other, and what it was for. And uh, I joined it on programme two. And they genuinely didn't know in advance what the things were. They didn't know in advance, but, but we, we have, my job was to go and select them. The object, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, directing cameras in that first stage. I was a, a PA, a production oh, I assistant. Right. I certainly directed some, and uh, of course it was, went through a number of series. So it was, over the years I certainly directed quite a lot. Mm. But I also did other programmes as well. I noticed that you went on a three-month training course. What was your training like? Oh, I can tell you what the first, the first lecture was. There we, we were, it, it was the first production training course that they had uh, arranged, n television production number one. And it was run by a man called Royston Morley. And what he knew about television production was uh, very limited indeed, because uh, there had, had hardly been any. And we were um, a mixed lot. There was the director of RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. There were um, musicians or musical critics. Uh, there was uh, journalists and there were aspiring politicians, those sort of people. Uh, and, I, and I was one of them. Uh, and the very first lecture was a man <laughs> who came in with a box of coloured chalks 
and proceeded to draw a series of squares and, and circles on the blackboard, all limited by different coloured lines, which was the structure of the BBC. And it, it took... <laughs> it wasn't what I thought I'd joined for. It was nothing to do. We weren't, we weren't even allowed to see a studio. Uh, we, he was explaining the responsibility of the governors yes, and the yes. relationship with the television service and the, with, the, with their audience and so on. There was only the two studios up at Alexander Palace, mm. which were quite too busy enough to get programmes out without having half a dozen or a dozen people who didn't know anything about anything wandering around the studios. Mm. So we weren't allowed to go and look into a studio. And they, even, they had... Did they have... Um, uh, certainly, for, in order to train politicians, we had a tea chest with some cocoa tins at the front, or, and so, so you were looking through them, so that you did pretendy cameras, because we hadn't got real cameras, to show them what, what a political broadcast could be like. When you joined, it was just Ali Pali. Yes, all as far as television was concerned. Yes, as yeah. far as television was concerned. Yes, yes. And, but it was known that uh, Lime Grove uh, was being negotiated for, and... Uh, and was then bought. Lime Grove was, of course, a film studio, a feature film studio, yes. uh, and it would take some time to adapt it for television. But it, it hadn't opened by the time I was, became a, a trainee director or a young director. And the big movement was when, when suddenly we were going to go the, the, the new studios in Lime Grove, which were equipped with cameras with turrets, which was going to be uh, a huge advance, so that you could actually change lens in the middle in the middle of a production. Yes, four lenses, if I remember rightly, normally. Mm. Because you were told what the angles were, and you had protractors to draw. For planning, you did, yes, yes. that's correct. You know, the way that you prepared a programme with protractors and stencils and floor plans and everything else. Presumably that came in only when you had a Lime Grove or Television Centre. Yes, that's correct. But at the same time, uh, you know, they produced operas in uh, Alexander Palace Two studios, really? yes. What, what uh, Pagliacci or mm. one of the one-act yes. operas and so on? Yes, extraordinary. They produced Shakespeare too, and they were all live, of course. And they were all live. When did telerecording start? Oh, not for quite a long time. The first telerecordings were there um, entirely so that you, as a producer, might be able to see what your program looked like, because there was no recording good enough for for repeat on transmission. So if you had if there was a, a, a telerecording apparatus, which was invented by, I think, called Don Smith, as I'm incorrect, uh, who was in, in, in television news and was a, a, an inventive chap, and he invented a device which was effectively a Bolex camera strapped in front of a monitor um, in which he recorded uh, the output. It was the only way you could see it. It was very fuzzy uh, and of course with 405 lines so it was completely unsuitable for for uh, retransmission. Yes. But it was done in order that you as a producer might be able to see what what you had, what a mess you had made of the whole thing. Yes. And let me just ask you at that point, I've been, I've been looking up ZooQuest and there are uh, on the BBC Genome Project which is the Radio Times from 1922 all the way through, they're now inserting little clips of programmes you can watch. And there are two or three ZooQuest programmes. The uh, ZooQuest programmes had two ingredients. Um, they had studio agreements in which yeah. uh, animals, you as the, the presenter, I mean, in this case, it, it, by this stage it was me, but we had shot material out there on film and this was the first 60 millimetre film used by the BBC, and, and it was a big row in order to persuade them to abandon 35 mil, which the engineers were all against. And the head of BBC Films was absolutely adamant that 60 millimetre wouldn't give the right quality. And I was saying, well, I can't film an, a man from the zoo collecting animals in, no. in West Africa with a 35 millimetre camera. I'll have to take 16. And he, would, he said, we had a big row and a big meeting, and the head of television, Cecil McGiven, mm. uh, took a chair. And a man called Philip Dorte, who was the head of, of BBC Films, uh, said, the, uh, in the end, uh, he said, I said I can't do the programmes unless I have 16. He said, the day that television 
a 16 millimeter as standard will be over my dead body, he said. Um, it, and, I mean, and, that presupposes that the quality of the output was really terrifically high. No, it was terrific. But it was actually quite crude, four no, or five miles. No, it was terrifically yeah. low. Yeah. Um, I mean, Tony said in the in the end, it was discovered that really the reason why 16 millimeter was uh, very muddy and, and, uh, in, and fuzzy was that there was a fault in the telecine apparatus rather than the, the camera, than the quality of the, on the film. The film quality was there, just that we didn't have the technology. Now, this is interesting because the clips of ZooQuest that they have include the opening titles, you in the studio announcing the films, mm. the films themselves, which I agree with you, look very muddy, and then back to the studio and maybe then, then there, there would be an animal or something which you could use close-ups for but those were recorded really very early weren't they i mean that was well from the, from, from the, the reasons i was yeah, suggesting yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. but it's interesting that they still have bits of studio there you see what yeah, I mean? yes yes yeah. um, but of course they were uh, fairly wide angle stuff and it was the oh, stuff yes. in the studio oh, was yes. mostly yes. me or sure. someone yes, but else the whole talking. thing the whole thing was there now i want to ask you about appearing in front of a camera being in a studio and interviewing somebody and the cameras were so close to you and to whoever it was that you were interviewing, you couldn't actually see each other. No. Is that true? Well, if you wanted a close-up, if you yeah. were directing an interview yeah. and you really wanted a close-up of maybe hands twitching or maybe just a close-up of a pro chap's profile, the camera had to be within about a couple of feet, you know. Um, and so if you wanted a, a really telling close-up of someone saying and now we're going to take you somewhere or do something you had to be, he had to make that announcement sort of staring at the camera mm. and, and worse of course was when he actually had to ask a question looking not at the interviewee but at, um, at the camera now coming back to you as a presenter i mean to camera how did you learn to do that was it just something that you naturally did well, I suppose if you're trained and you knew what went on in a studio, uh, you knew enough about the mechanics to know what was demanded of you as an interviewer. Yes. Um, but there was no other training or way, way of doing it. But you had no, no, no autocue? Or... No autocue. Autocue. The, the BBC, there was a, a, a studio manager called Mervyn Pinfield. And he invented a thing called the, the Pinny Prompter, um, which was actually had the... Uh, the text that you wanted to put in front of the camera on a couple of reels which were hand driven, hand wound. So the, <laughs> the chap working Pinny Pop was lying on the floor uh, winding this thing while you were trying to talk. Um, but it was quickly overtaken because, of course, the technology was being developed by American television. They were much more professional, lots of bags of money, and yeah. one thing or another. And so the, the Pinny Pompter had a rather short life. Uh, but I think they were ahead of the game at one stage, but it, not for long. The yeah. Americans took over, and, and we had the American device eventually. Yeah, but you seem to, you know, just be a natural. I don't know. It, it, a lot of it was. Was it? No, were I you didn't, reading I didn't a script, a, or I, you were I you? I didn't use a teleprompter. No, at you all. just, you just knew us. Yes, I mean, any more you would. Structure. Did, yes. Uh, in, in, a, in a village meeting. Now, tell me about the the, the first time that you got animals in the studio, because. Um, it's very interesting, your relationship with, with the London Zoo. you had done zoology, so obviously you knew people there. But the first idea to bring a, a live animal into the studio, when was that? Um, uh, we were pretty serious-minded in, in, in the talks department, and, uh, and the head, Mary Adams, who was a, a considerable intellectual, I mean, she was a, she was a very important uh, 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 figure, really, and she had high standards and believed that the television programmes should have high intellectual standards. Mm. And the more serious the programmes were, as far as she was concerned, the, the better it was. Uh, I was a, a zoologist graduate. She was actually a geneticist, oh. uh, Mary, Mary Adams from Oxford. Um, and um, I, when the time came that I thought I could suggest in programmes of my own, own invention, um, I thought, well, what I know about is, is zoology, so why wouldn't I do a series about with live animals, with animals? Mm. 
Well, to start with, since we, they would have to be live animals, so where are you going to get those from? And that was the answer. That was the London Zoo. And that had already been pioneered by George Cansdale, who was the director there, the keeper of mammals at the London Zoo, and was a very competent chap. And he, he one of the big established successes was George Cansdale bringing animals from, that were in his charge from London Zoo and putting them on a table in front of him and talking about them. Mm. Um, but poor creatures, I mean, they were, they'd been fished out in the middle of the night uh, from their comfortable lodgings in the zoo, <laughs> brought, bundled in, put in a sack, brought up to London to Alexander Palace, and given to George by, uh, handed to George by a keeper, and he, he would then describe this bedazzled, terrified creature um, and explain what it was wanting to talk about, and, and, and that was it. And sometimes it peed down its front, which was all a great yes, success. Well, yes. Sometimes it escaped and so on. So they were popular programs. Yes. But I thought that it was an injustice to animals to simply show them out of their, out of their right environments where they, their anatomy made sense. So why couldn't we film out there? Well, there was a, a, a husband and wife pair called Armand Mikada Dennis, oh, who had yes. lived in Kenya, yes. and they had been, been they making films, 16 mils on yes. colour films, actually, Kodachrome. Oh, right. um, and and they, we had used some of theirs, and, and we had one or two of theirs had already gone out. They were on 16 mil, why couldn't I be on 16 mil? Yes. But instead of just saying what you happen to encounter, I thought, well, to tell some sort of intellectual story. And so I devised three programmes uh, about what animals looked like, because this was vision, that's what you could see, you could see where they got patterns or long legs. This was or, called animal patterns, wasn't it? This was hmm. And the first programme would be about camouflage, and the second would be about display, and that sort of thing. And I wrote a, a proposal, and the, the head of the department uh, said, Mary Adams said, uh, very, very good, write out more detail, which I did. And, um, and then she said, yes, well, we need uh, a zoologist to present it. I said, yes. And she said, I know Julian Huxley, who was a very distinguished biologist. Uh, and uh, I'll have a word with him and see whether he would do it. Mm. And so I got the message in due course that he was interested. I went down to see him in Hampstead. Um, and he agreed to do it. And I showed him the script. I wrote it out in some detail. Uh, and we, it consisted of him looking at camera and then a, someone handing him a kangaroo or whatever, mm. or a snake. And he would then say what the important bit, message was and then move on to the next one. I mean, it couldn't be more simple, but it was reasonably popular. It had yeah. quite, a, quite a, an academic message to it, yeah. um, but it, was, it did well. So that was how I started, uh, seeing that television live and it could be exciting. Mm. And it was that that led to me thinking, well, maybe if the zoo were going to send an expedition to collect animals, we could, I could get both things. I would be able to get it in the wild, I would be able to get the drama of it being caught, and I would get to the, which would show on film, and then we would get to the animal itself um, in the studio, well, as it went out. And the, if we tele-recorded that bit, yes. which they probably did, it yes. would be for our benefit rather than the audience, because ah, yes. we never showed that. Never shown twice? I don't think so, no. because it, the quality was so poor. Before we do ZooQuest, um, let's get some timings. And You said famously that when you joined the BBC, you had only seen one television programme. Hmm. Now, this was when you joined the BBC, so it's before the coronation. Can you remember what it was? Um, yes, it was a, a, a translation of, it was a play, Asmodee, I think it was, by a French dramatist who was, and the television set belonged to my wife's uh, parents. He was the chief chemist of Shell, so he was a big technolo technology oh. chap, and mm. he had one of these early television yeah. sets. And I'd seen that, but that was the only thing I'd ever seen. The coronation was in '53. Sorry, I think you, you. I think you joined in '52, but the coronation was '53. Now that must have used almost all the BBC's resources. Were you involved at all? No, not at all. Not at all. Peter Dimmock was the big guru from television. He took charge. And did you, by that time, have a television set? I can't be sure. I don't no. think so because I hadn't. No, I hadn't been taken on. Uh, I hadn't, hadn't, but when you were taken on, you were given, the corporation gave you a television set, yeah. or, or lent you a television set, yeah. Uh, yeah. provided you with a television yes. set. 
you were also doing things like party political broadcasts. I was a member of, of, of Talks Department, um, and uh, in those days uh, there were things called party political broadcasts, which, uh, coming up to an election, were allocated to, to the political parties. Yeah. And so it was agreed as to how long they ran and how many there were, and that was the subject of negotiation with the political parties. The, the job of producing was all kicks and no halfpence because, you, I mean, they were terrible broadcasts because uh, they weren't used to using television. Uh, and they had they, they, the idea of intimate talks was not hadn't occurred to them, but they addressed it as though it was a, um, a public meeting. And they were a, a killer as far as the audience were concerned. And so on. Yes. But um, they had to be done. And so there was a, a routine. Uh, we had a rotor. Uh, as to we, who, which poor soul was going to have to produce these um, broadcasts. Yes. And there were five minutes, ten minutes, five minutes, I think, something like that, mm. very quite short. And there were also ministerial broadcasts, which were uh, on a different rotor. They wanted to speak to the, the electorate directly. So, tell me about Eden, because that's a very famous story. But, I mean, in, in terms of the people who were there in Eden's bedroom when you went up to do that very famous Suez programme, I mean, there was Selwyn Lloyd, Macmillan, and so on. It must be an extraordinary feeling going into that environment. Oh, terrifying, actually, except that I think I was really so naive that I didn't realise um, how close we were to major war, really. And I, I, uh, there was the rotor that you had to do for ordinary politicians and different parties, but there was also a separate rotor for what was called ministerial broadcasts. Um, and I, it was my turn on the rotor that I had to produce Eden's, one of the early ones. And I got on well with Eden, uh, and um, Eden liked what, uh, the way I, I dealt with it and asked asked for me personally, rather to my embarrassment, since I didn't share his politics. <laughs> but nobody knew what politics you had no. as a television producer. Um, but anyway, I was, it was a Saturday, and I was living in Richmond, where I still live, uh, and I got a message, might have been the day before, but not much more, to say that Eden needed to speak to the nation, and, and would I go to uh, up to number 10? Um, and I remember it was a Saturday because uh, my wife drove me up because I don't drive, and we got to Chelsea and and and, uh, and, and couldn't get by because of the football crowds. But anyway, I eventually got there, and um, and I went to see the PR man, a one man called William Clark, who was a very good journalist from the Observer, and who, uh, but was Eden's PR man. I went down to see him. He lived in our office in the basement in Number Ten. And uh, Willie said, um, you better go up. Uh, I, the old man is in bed. Uh, he's not at all well. Um, he won't speak to me. I don't know quite why. But you just you better go up and see what you can do. So I got in the lift and went up to the top floor, which was Eden's flat, Prime Minister's flat. And Eden was in bed. Uh, and at the back of his, and uh, along the headband, along the shelf at the, the top of the bed, there were loans of pills, and the members of the part of the cabinet were sitting around. And he was actually reading um, a script. Mm. Uh, he was halfway through it, and uh, I went in, and he, he looked ashen, and, and I mean, he was obviously sick. Yes. Uh, and I said, oh, come in, David, no, I'm just going through this. And so I joined the group, the rest of them, and, uh, and he went rather faltering voice went on reading this thing, and uh, every now and again he would stop and say, um, do you think this is when I should say friends, or some, some footling question like that? Um, and after we'd been through it at least twice, if not three times, um, it was clear to me that since this was a live broadcast, uh, he was going to have to make this speech within another couple of hours or something. Um, and I, to my astonishment, heard myself saying in front of all the rest of the cabinet, <laughs> Prime Minister, I think it's time you had a rest. Um, and we, we will, um, otherwise if you've got to broadcast live in, in another couple mm. of hours, you really ought to take a rest. And so everybody said, oh yes, very well, and we trooped out. Um, and, um, and I went down and we'd taken over the, one of the front rooms in, in number 10 on the ground floor. 
And it was late Eden's um, front room, really. And, of course, we'd taken it over, and you know what a mess th th that means. I mean, lights everywhere and monitors everywhere and, and, and shambles. It was, and I, I was trying to sort it out and going out and sitting in the control room, and the, control, uh, the, the gallery, the, you know, the gallery, outside broadcast unit house. And um, Lady Eden, poor woman, I mean, it was her, she was in a terrible state, really. I mean, after all, mm. it was a front room, you were on the verge of war, and you're about to speak to the nation. You can't help being a bit edgy or tetchy. So I, it's clear to me that the one thing she should not do is to be shown looking at a monitor. Mm. Because to start with the monitor, you can't judge anything if you've got all the studio lighting. Um, and from another thing, uh, she would bound to be saying something's wrong with it. So I said to the studio manager, out the outside broadcast, I said, um, try and keep Lady Eden away from Monitor. Don't, don't, don't. But he couldn't. And, uh, and uh, eventually she got a glimpse of the Monitor within a few minutes of actually going live to speak to the world. And she said, um, this, 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 it's terrible, you can't see his moustache. And, um, and took out her handbag and uh, took her uh, eyebrow uh, mascara thing and took it and, and as it were inked in his moustache. Now I have to say that I published this eventually after his death um, and she was outraged and said it couldn't possibly have happened because she didn't carry mascara in her handbag and she wouldn't have had it there and various other. Um, I, I cannot believe that I made it up. I cannot believe no, that I invented it. That. Um, and, um, and that was terrifying, really, because I was uh, uh, maybe ingenuous and uh, uh, not a man of the world, but it was clear to me that we were on the edge of World War, uh, World War III. He had had he had been in America, he had had a botched operation. I don't know the medical details, mm. but I know that he had a, a major ob abdominal operation in this country, and which didn't which didn't go right. And the only way that it could be fixed was that he was flown to America, uh, where they would repair it or try and put it together oh. again. So he genuinely wasn't well. Oh, oh, but it, but it oh, wasn't very serious. He can't. seriously ill. <laughs> Right, let's come back to ZooQuest. So you're, you're about to begin the, really your first trips abroad to film animal. Yes, very first trip. I'd never been to Africa before. Mm. That was in 1954. Um, and um, we went with the keeper of the, of the reptile house, a lovely man called Jack Lester, who knew Sierra Leone very well, had been out there in the, in the bank in the interwar years. Yeah. And he was a very good naturalist, and he was very good at catching snakes and things. And, um, and that was going to be fine. And, um, and so we filmed him doing all those things uh, and came back. But unfortunately, he had uh, some physical disease, some, mm. some, some affliction that meant he couldn't, he, he couldn't do it. Uh, he was going to present it. He was, he was the presenter. The, he, he, he was the expert. He, was the, he, was, he would explain why he was wanted to do a, catch a particular species. We would then show him on film, which we filmed, of him doing precisely that. And then at the end of it, you would come back, and, and there was the animal that he had seen on film in the studio with, with him handling it. Um, and that was what it was going to be. Um, but uh, in the event, just before he did it, yes, I think it was the, the day before, uh, he couldn't, couldn't go on, and he was taken to hospital, and somebody had to do it. It was in the Radio Times, you know, the programme. And who else would do it? Well, I was the only person there. There was only Charles Lagos, who was the cameraman, and who wasn't on staff either. Uh, and there was me, and, and that was it. So there was only one person who could do it, and I was just told to leave the gallery, to somebody else from the department who had handled the cameras and go down and present it from the, from the studio. You'd produced it, so you had scripts that you'd, you were... Well, in as much as you had a script, well, you didn't. Yes, right. you, I yes, mean, sure. the script wouldn't have said anything more than uh, the presenter 
shows uh, details of the claws or mm. whatever. But you were given the animal and you had to cope with yeah. it. And then you yes. would introduce the next sequence. And while that was playing, the uh, keeper from the zoo would take one animal and then give you another one, yeah. the next one. Now, those programmes are terribly popular. Um, and the combination... Well, there was only one network, after all. So, yes. Sure. It was the first 60 mil cam footage ever shown, yes. on, on, as far as I can know. Well, no, no, that's not quite true, because there was the, the Armand Michaela Dennis, yes, who shown, I've just yes, mentioned, sir. had been already shown some yes, of their... Yes. But their, their, they had used Kodachrome, which had terrible contrast ratio, mm. so that it was... Uh, and it was in black and white, of course. Colour pictures in black and white. But it, they were nonetheless extremely popular because, you know, this is the first time people have seen wild elephants and yes. giraffes and things. It, it was very exciting. No, as a boy, I remember seeing those. I, I spent six months of the year, mm. the first three months, uh, 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 well, three months preparing the thing, three months shooting it and transmitting it, mm. and, and so the six programmes. And then for the other six programmes, I was doing part of political broadcasts and programmes on architecture and quizzes and animal and, and yeah. so on. How did you get around in those early days? You flew on, were they charter flights or were they... Uh, oh, no, no, there was, there was a, a DC-3, a Dakota, which went down, the first one went down to West Africa but because in, in 1954, that's what we're talking about, uh, there was no way in which um, commercial aircraft could fly during the night. There was no radar, uh, radio mm. uh, navigation systems. So that we had to stop the first night in Casablanca and the second night in Dakar, and then eventually we got to Freetown. So it took us three days to get there. Very exciting, that first Oh, thrilling, trip. yes. Yeah, and, and stepping out of, of, of a DC-3, and the door opens, and suddenly you get this... It's like being immersed in Mulligatawny soup. I mean, it, it, it loaded 100% with uh, um, moisture in the air and yes. the smells of, of, of tropical Africa. Yes, yes. So the first time you smell it, you, it's unforgettable. Now, I came across some other Radio Times billings slightly after this period, I suspect, when you were doing a, a science magazine programme with James McCloy. Mm, James McCloy the head of science, yes. Now, he was my mentor when I joined the BBC. Oh, was he? He was a very good, uh, marvellous man. And very um, good on helping non-television people to present things. Yes. Did he, come, did he affect you in any way, apart from just being a producer? Yeah, well, he was a producer, and, uh, and I, I did some uh, presentation jobs for him. Uh, I remember, he, he, will you come and, and explain mitosis and DNA uh, in uh, 90 seconds or something, that sort of thing? And, he was, a, he was a, a very, very competent uh, and very meticulously a uh, um, man, yeah. actually, in, in production. Uh, uh, he cared for detail. You had to get it right. And those days, he took science very seriously. There wasn't a science department, of course, but uh, it was part of the tox department. And James was a science, senior scientific producer. And that we produced big things. I and mean, you produced three-hour programmes, in which, or at least two and a half, maybe, uh, in which you dealt with the discovery of DNA. A live, live studio, three hours, and James did produce those. Yes. There's an apocryphal story that James did a test, a test on television to see if cats always landed on their feet. And Could once have done, but he, I, said, he told done, me but, the story. But the, way you would, <laughs> the only way you would do that is actually on film. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yes. You'd have to do it on film because yes. you couldn't see it if you dropped a cat. You wouldn't be able to see whether well, how it had done it. <laughs> no, I but but you, on, on film you could. Yes, yes. Well, it's just an apocryphal story, or at least mm. a story he told me. Um, so let's come back. You, you then had a series of programmes where you, where you went on location, so you were doing this mixture of things. Um, you, you formed the Travel and Exploration Unit, I think, didn't you? Yes, that was only a matter of, um, of internal bureaucratic... Warfare. <laughs> <laughs> you you had more clout if you had, and and you also had, uh, if if you managed to get someone to turn you into a unit of that sort, you had some guaranteed output because it was costing the corporation a lot of money. I mean, with you and a couple of producers and so yeah. on. Um, and why would you do that if you didn't weren't sure that you were going to have a continuing output? So it was a way of of establishing a. Um, a place in the schedules. Yeah. 
And was it when you had formed that that you did the trip to Australia, northern Australia, I think? Yes, I'm just just trying. That was, I think, that was the first time in Australia that I took a recordist. I think and Bob Saunders was his name, and dear man he was. He was a um, he was the mixer in the in the dubbing studio, and uh, I ran a thing called um, Traveller's Tales, something like that, and I had I had a, a, a weekly booking. Uh, in uh, in Ealing, and Bob, who chain smoked, <laughs> was in this charge of this huge mixing desk with these three assistant disc spinners who were going to put in discs for the effects and so on. And uh, I, so we got to know one another well, and, and we used to lunch in the Red Lion, and uh, and Bob would say, "Oh God, I just to see the sunshine," you know. He always had a wonderful time. And eventually, um, when I came to do the trip in Australia, uh, I thought we could be, try and be a bit more professional and do more stuff on air and take a recording with us. And I got the money for that and asked Bob to do it. And, uh, and Bob then, be, <laughs> he then abandoned his desk and the mixing desk and became one of the toughest of, uh, of, of travelling recordists. He was... Um, Bob's no longer with us, I mean, sadly. Um, in those days, too, um, if you were doing a commentary, you didn't have rock and roll dubbing, did you? You, you, no, you, no. you had to do no, it in no. one. Well, yes, uh, for the reason that, that we recorded on magnetic film, and, and not only magnetic film, but 35 mil magnetic film. Uh, 16 mil wasn't uh, robust enough. Um, and so it was very complicated because 16 mil running at one speed and 35 mil, you know, it was whizzing away on the other. That, that was what we had to do. And and Bob, it was the first time that uh, that Bob had gone out there and and, and as a and as a recordist, he became one of the toughest travelling producers because yes. he moved from recordings to, uh, to directing. Yeah. On which he did very well. But you were able to do pieces to camera for the first time yes. from the location. And you like you like being on the road with crews. Oh, it's it's great. I mean, they're all pals. I mean, uh, yeah. great friends. Yes. Um, I mean, for friendships of course were formed during that, and uh, and then we had some fairly rough times. I mean, living. I don't mean any. Uh, the, the, we were living in fairly hardened circumstances, in yes. tents, one thing or another. You get to know people very well, and either you, you like them or you don't, and either you get on with them or you don't. And happily, cameramen in particular uh, and, and recorders, uh, they're great guys, you know. I mean, uh, and it's some of the happiest times of my life. I mean, out on location with, yes. with those with those pals, old stand, long-standing friends. My job when at that stage, before having becoming an administrator, was not to produce natural history films, particularly, but travel films. Uh, but I had uh, actually made natural history films before the establishment of the unit, so they couldn't very well stop me. But um, by and large, so when it came to Australia, that was a film really almost much more about the Australian people uh, than it was about animals. OK. Well, that's... Uh... That led to many things, but there came a point when you you left the BBC uh, to do your anthropology postgraduate thing at, uh, at LSE, I believe. Mm. What what made you leave? Um, well, by this time, I'd been in the BBC uh, for ten years probably, and I'd done a lot. Of, I, I I thought you can't go on making this Zoo Quest programmes, which is mm. what I'm doing, um, and in any case. I, I would, I'd come to, as it were, top of a ladder. Um, and you know what happens when you get to the top of a ladder in, in quite a lot of organisations, including the BBC. You're sitting up there, um, and there's nowhere else to go up the ladder, except go on another ladder. Or fall off it. <laughs> or, or, or fall off it. Oh, yes, or be sent to education, which was another, another way of doing it. But what's that? that's a serious problem. I mean, when I got into management, that is a serious problem. What do you do with a live wire, inventive, top-of-the-rank mm. producer who's, who's reached the top and is doing very well, but has got electronic developments and inventions coming up behind him, yes. but he's stuck. That's, that's, he knows what to do, but... 
And so the only way to do that I, I worked it out myself and my own logic was, there you are, you've been at the top of this ladder now for some time, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay on until you're sent to a, a further education mm. um, or training? Mm. Um, uh, no, you should get on another ladder. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to decide that I would break and I had always wanted to do interested in anthropology and I wanted to do an, an anthropological degree and I got a, an agreement whereby I could go to uh, the LSE and do a, an anthropological to part-time degree um, and the, for six months and then the BBC would take me on to do um, another trip a, abroad for six months mm. and that way I'd be able to pay for my my further education. Were you continuously employed by the BBC but then given that time off that's, or did you actually I think I resigned leave. from the BBC you actually. actually resigned. I, um, somebody, my accountant, would tell you whether I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, think I, I think I actually rather foolishly broke my continuous service of the BBC in order to do that. Yeah. But, I, but when you're what I, whatever I was then, that didn't seem to be very important. But that was going to be a two-year um, postgraduate course? Two, yes, two or, two or three. You said that anthropology came in very useful when it came to the, um, the human relationships in BBC meetings, yes. where people sat. Yes, well, one of the things that... Um, I mean, why I went to the excuse or, or rationale of going to the LSE and doing it would be that I should be thinking about how film cameras, 60mm film cameras, which were portable cameras for the first time, how they should be used by anthropologists to help in their work. Um, and obviously they could be used, one of the ways of using was to rec film rituals uh, in order that you could see details of what was happening uh, and, and there were other compl complexities involved in that. But anyway, that was what I was going to do. Um, and I did um, two sessions. I've forgotten where I went in the middle. But I did two sessions at the LSE. And then on the sec during the second one, I was uh, got in touch by BBC and they said, we would like you to th wonder whether you would come back and consider applying for the job of controller bit of our new network of BBC Two. That was the most extraordinary telephone call to get, if I might say so. Yeah. Can I just ask you then to, to row back slightly to what had happened in the BBC in those intervening years? I mean, we had suddenly the opening of BBC Two as 625 lines. Uh, the new network was necessary because uh, en engineering standards had become much more sophisticated. Instead of 405 lines, which were, it was going to move on to 625, and it had to be on 625 lines because that was the minimum you could, uh, engineers could work with if they were actually going to be transmitting colour. And so this was a new network was coming. It was on 625 lines, and it would be the network of the future. Uh, and But what it did mean was that you had to build a completely new network of television transmitters around the country mm -hmm. because you couldn't adapt 405 line transmitters to 625. They had different uh, coverage maps, for example. They had to have a completely new network. Um, but that meant new equipment as well, of course. Uh, entirely. Uh, and so the new studios would be 625 lines but at that time, they were black and white. Mm. Colour hadn't yet approved it, but when colour came, it would be on 65 lines. But it was only three or four la uh, years later, I believe. Yes. Yes. Now, when it opened, BBC Two, I mean, notoriously, of course, it had this terrible disaster when there was a, a power failure in, in West 12, and um, Dennis Toohey had to appear with a candle, and I seem to remember that David Collison said he was keeping BBC One on the air by going on book ballroom dancing, and they had to extend the thing until the power came back at Television Centre. But Pe Michael Peacock was running the channel, and it was generally reckoned to be not working. Well, fair play to Mike Peacock. Um, Mike had been on the television, same, same television training course as I had. Um, it was the first television. And, and Mike was the um, star performer from the London School of Economics. Uh, I'm a very, very bright and able man. 
Um, and he, um, he came in and invented panorama, for example, and he became a current affairs guru in the, in, and, and left talks department to go to run television news, which was a very uh, uh, difficult job and demanding job. Um, and then when the revolutionary came that we were going to have, to have a third network and that the BBC two had been given it, he was, became the first director, the first controller of, of uh, BBC Two, uh, with the job of uh, inventing a completely new network and deciding what to put on it. He had been running, at this point that we're talking about now, this new network with new programme policies uh, for about a year. And it had been not a success by quite a long way. And fair play, Mike only had a, a studio and a half in which he was going to operate, I mean, uh, to start with. And, and um, he, he had a difficulty in finding he was going to 625-line programmes of any kind. Mm. And his solution in the end was, to, he put a brave face on it and called it the seven faces of the week. Mm. Each day would have a different kind of program. There would be a sporting day, and there would be a, a teaching day, and there would be a repeat day, and so on. I mean, he, it was imposed upon him. It was the only way he could get on the air. He was told by the government, who doesn't care tuppence about problems about broadcasting, <laughs> that they, the BBC had to start it on that day. Yeah. Not because well, they had programmes ready, but they had to start it on a day. And Mike did, did that. He got it on the air, uh, but it was not a success. Um, and it was, you really can't blame Mike for that. It was the other circumstances which imposed that, that solution. It was the only way that he could actually produce programmes. So a night of repeats, you know, it's not a way that he could have start sell a new network. And so he came in, um, and then there was a, a palace revolution of, of other people involved, including Donald Bavistock and various other people that you'll talk about elsewhere, no doubt. Um, and um, and Hugh Weldon um, was appointed as controller pro or director of whatever he was in charge of programs. Mm. He became the boss. I've forgotten the various titles that were now. But he became the boss, and he decided that Donald Bavistock, who was also from Talks Department, was then running BBC One. Mike was running uh, Television News, mm. and he would. Hugh decided that he would appoint Mike onto BBC One and take Bavistock, who was a wild card, really, a, a brilliant man with brilliant ideas and so on, but uh, pretty erratic. And, he, and that's the sort of inventive mind you wanted for, to do new things on BBC Two. And he said to Donald, I want you to take over BBC Two. And Donald um, said, uh, no, he wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. he, it was a secondary job and he wasn't interested. Mm -hmm. And so Hugh, then came to me, and I was freelance on my um, at the LSE or yes. on my television, LSE stages, and said, "Would I be interested in taking on BBC Two?" I, well, I remember debating to myself and saying, "Look, you've got to your make your mind up. If you want to be an anthropologist, you stay at the LSE, and if you want to be a freelance writer and so on, you stay at the LSE. But if you want to be interested in broadcasting," and you're interested in television, this is the best job in world television, by quite a long way. Yes. Um, and uh, I didn't need long to make up my mind. Mm. So I went to Hugh after, I mean, I slept overnight on it, and Hugh at that stage lived, I live in here in Richmond, where I live now, mm. but Hugh was a, a couple of hundred yards on the crest of Richmond Hill. Um, and I went round and said, oh, I've thought about it, I will, I will take your invitation. But I won't guarantee that I will stay longer than five years. Uh, and it may be that I'll then return to programme making, but I'd love to do it for five years. And on that basis, Hugh took me. Hugh was somebody I remember very fondly, if that's the right word. I mean, he was very formidable. Oh. But he was a lovely man. Um, an amazing, oh, um, oh yes. Uh, uh, one of the most formidable personalities I've met in my yes. life. Yes. I mean, he would hold, well, lunch meetings for assistant producers, yes. and they would talk about programmes, yes. and they would talk about cultural things and so on. So he was, he was in a perfect position to be a very great supporter to you. Hugh asked me what I would do with BBC Two, yeah. 
And indeed, I had to, after having been appointed, I had to give up one of the BBC t- lectures called BBC Two, uh, in which I had set out saying what our program policy, overall policy, I had for this new network. And I said uh, that we will provide alternative viewing because there was home recording at that stage was was in its infancy, mm. if it indeed existed, and so the people could only see what was being offered live. And there was only ITV and BBC One. That there was only two networks. And the third network, what would the third network do? I said what it would do, would it would be find programmes of a kind that you could find nowhere else on either of the, of the existing networks. So, and you would, so you could turn on a television set and you'd say and read immediately, that must be a BBC Two programme. Now, the, the, the debate before that went on was interpreted by some people as whether it's a highbrow or lowbrow. Yes. And I said, different programmes is not the same as a highbrow or lowbrow. That is a false antithesis. Yes. We, we won't take that. It, we will show programmes of the different kind, like every department in the, from, the, from the BBC, so including sport. So we would think of new... I wanted new, new sports. And we would do, from the music programme, new, new kind of music programmes, new serious music, and we would do folk music. We would do whatever it was that was new, with new kind of dramas, 30-minute programmes, 30-minute playlets, all sorts of things. Anyway, so the, and, and we would also ar- arrange a network so there were things what I call common junctions, which meant there were times when you deliberately made sure that programmes on one network were ending and programmes on the other two networks was there available, so you could switch. And that we would cross trail. Yes. And we would trail, we would, on BBC One, would tell people what they could see on BBC Two, which a lot of people didn't wish to know about. I remember Mike Peacock said, I don't really want to drive people away from my network <laughs> or to your network. But I said, and my job was to say, look, this is all the BBC. And it was that, that was what I tried to do, and I wrote a lecture about it in the BBC lecture series, so I know what I said. Yes. I've got a list here, and it says um, Chronicle, Horizon. Tomorrow's Horizon was science. Yes. A regular science programme. Yes, but you still commissioned it. Oh, yes, Yes, cool. absolutely. Tomorrow's World? And, and I should say, fair play, Horizon was one of the programmes that Mike originated. The Pythons you commissioned, I believe. Monty Python. Much, much later, and there was on BBC Two opt out. But I think the Q series, the Spike Milligan series, was in your Maybe. bailiwick. Um, the money programme. Well, economics. Nobody my, else was doing economics. Yeah. My Word? My Word was, was a, a programme for people with some interest in, in, in actually vocabulary. It was, a, it was a panel game, Yes. but it had a completely different basis of, uh, of expertise that was being uh, examined. And my music as well. Then we took seriously, seriously, serious music, very seriously. We we introduced um, visual scores of music. So you have a quartet play and you could actually see the score and you could trace the themes which had different colours on the different instruments and so on. So you were making use of new technology with graphics and what have you there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Man Alive. Well, that was a very freewheeling kind of documentary, social yes. documentary, of a, by Desmond Wilcox. Desmond Wilcox, yeah. Call My Bluff, well... Late. Well, that was a quiz yes. programme, yes. but OK, it was, but we were going to do a quiz on a different, different basis. Yes. A quiz that had uh, an intellectual challenge, in, in yes. that uh, you had to make up a, a definition uh, and def- were presented with a word, will you please define it? Yeah. Now, at the same time, you were also trying to develop the um, uh, archaeology and things like that. And you had the Silbury Hill. Um, that was for the thing. opening of, 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 of BBC uh, Two. Oh, was that early? Yes. Right. Um, um, I wanted to need publicity. And, uh, and there you've got the M4 going straight by it. And you were able to put up all kinds of, of posters saying, <laughs> you know, watch BBC Two to see what's going on here. Oh, great. I hadn't thought of it as an advertising yeah. opportunity, yes. Well, I, I mean, I agree, uh, and, and, uh, and that is putting it as the lowest common denominator, but it was also an interesting thing to be able to do, mm. to try and, um, and say, oh, no, we will have cameras here at all times, and if, if something happens immediately, we will go over live, and so 
yeah. in the end, uh, we didn't get over. <laughs> in my view, the fates weren't weren't very very kind to us because um, I mean we didn't we didn't find uh, a skeleton. We didn't find um, substantial um, deposits of handicrafts or, or, or great skills or jewellery or gold or anything. Yes. Um, of course, I did my best to say, yes, we did, we found a lot. We found a lot of facts, which is that if you are serious about the yeah. archaeologists, facts they were after, not, not golden diadems. Yes. But, yes. Um, but nonetheless, it would be nice to have had a bit of gold. And snooker. And snooker, but the snooker didn't come in for two years because ah. the snooker one came in, Depended not because colour. of BBC Two, <laughs> but because of the introduction of colour. Yes. Tell us about colour. It must have involved a whole lot of rethinking how you use it what people wear, the sort of cameras you had, and so on, and also whether people had sets which could receive it. Uh, I imagine when BBC Two started, there were very few people with dual standard sets. Yes, yes. So colour was another one of these. Um, we had to buy a new set, yes. Uh, I mean, yes. What we tried to say was that we will, I won't say you are producing more colourful programmes, as it were. A programme about Scotland with tartans would be better than one about, <laughs> about something else. But, but no, what, what, what I tried to say was, we will show you the world in, in good, to, with greater high fidelity than you've yet seen it. And, it, and we are not in the business of, of thinking that, uh, that a comedian is funnier if you dress him in a tartan than if you dress in a dinner jacket. I mean, it is, uh, colour gives you a lot of opportunity to show things in a way that you haven't seen them before on television. Um, and uh, colour at the time had an extremely bad reputation amongst uh, television professionals. I mean, it would started in Japan and in the States already. Mm. But it was catastrophic. I mean, the American system was so bad that it had to take it off the air and re-engineer it. I mean, it yeah. was really... Never twice the same colour. Never twice the same colour. Uh, so that the, the, the reputation you had to deal with was one that, what, that television had gone colourful and, and had gone down market in a very big way. And the press was very happy to say that it was a waste of money. And there are a lot of, of, of people who congratulated themselves on their own high good taste who were prepared to rubbish it. So how do we convince them? Mm -hmm. And we took a, I took a different line, was that television is, is high definition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in order to demonstrate that, I wanted to find all the best paintings and, and architecture of the, that the world had produced in the last 10,000 years. Uh, so that, and there would be things that people knew about, but would be able to see in colour for the first time on television, yeah. and that was called civilization. Yeah. Paintings, I mean, Van Gogh, people have been, never know what colour Van Gogh's sunflowers look like. And from that, I thought, OK, well, that would be a bit claustrophobic, so we could mix it in with architecture and accompany the whole thing with relevant music, contemporary yeah. music. Um, and once you thought of that, you then thought, well, who are you going to get to guide us through all this? And we'll have to do it, ought to do it in a historical way. And there was, the obvious man was Kenneth Clark. And did he take to the thing with alacrity? No, uh, he didn't. Uh, he was, of course, the expert. He'd been the head of ITV, ITA, rather. Um, and we I invited him to lunch at the television centre and did my best to chat him up. And according to his own, his own account of it, 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 that what triggered it was that I mentioned the word civilization. And he says from then on he was suddenly realised all the possibilities. And while the conversation went on, he actually scribbled out on the back of a piece of paper or something he had handy uh, how it might go. He had a very patrician style, but that suited the time. Um, Yes, he was a patrician style, um, and of course, styles are styles. They they come and they go, and uh, even I mean, even now, it's it's somewhat out of fashion. It's it, it's out of fashion to pretend that other that there are experts. Experts are out of out of uh, favour. You're accused of elitism, and uh, yes, uh, yes, um, and, and that wasn't so when he was director of the. Of the National Gallery, for example. I mean, uh, and things have changed now. It's interesting to see when they tried to do a sequel to it that they didn't make those kind of statements that he was happy to make. But um, uh, I mean, that's a f question of fashion. I mean, either you think Leonardo da Vinci was a genius or you don't. 
But by and large, he was a genius, and uh, and somebody who studied him knows something about the way genius works. Um, and to pretend, pretend otherwise is a question of fashion, it seems to me. Yes, but expertise, in a sense, is kind of out of fashion. Oh, absolutely, what I'm saying. Experts yeah. are, are, um, are suspect, yeah. and people don't wish to believe them. I mean, it's out of the fashion to be unsatisfied saying you don't know something. And um, people all know as well as he does. You know, why, should, why should I listen to him? He, yes. he doesn't know any more about it than yeah. I do. Yes. And either if he thinks you know more about Leonardo da Vinci than, than, than he does, then he's wrong. Sure. Well, I, yes. I think that's a question of fashion. I don't think people are that stupid, really. Now, you, you, you managed to persuade people that it should be done in 35 mil. I know earlier in your no, career... I, I didn't manage to persuade ah, them right. uh, at all. Um, the engineers had to persuade me. Um, but the, the, you have to remember that the colour technology at that time was in a state of turmoil because the American system had yeah. proved to be garish beyond and su- oh. unsubtle beyond belief. And so BBC engineers worked on a, a, a new variation of that, which was, so it was untried. So we had a new system of colour transmission, uh, which was, uh, as I say, untried. And the engineers came to me and said, look, we can't guarantee that this will be any good on 60 mil, and please will you do it on 35? And uh, faced with that, what could I say? I mean, it would be absolutely silly I, I, to go against their advice. Um, and all I had to do was work out how to pay for it for my programme budget. And uh, the, uh, the answer to that was easy too. I mean, just repeat it. So half the cost per hour, per minute. That was a very clever move. <laughs> well, a fairly obvious one. So it got two transmissions. And of course, it's been transmitted recently. And because it's in 35mm, it's held up terrifically well because that's effectively now high definition, as we yes. have, have learned to, to call it. So that was a very successful thing. That was just the first of the blockbusters. But then you did a lot of things with, uh, with music, and you were using the studios too to put on operas, and also, well, you you commissioned, I think, uh, a thing from Benjamin Britten. But before that, you did Billy Budd in in TC1. Yes. Yeah, well, that, that was, was part of a deep laid plan, of course, um, that we were wanting to. It wasn't my idea. The BBC had always anybody knew cared about music in the BBC would know that we, sh- somebody somewhere, I should be desperately per- per- trying to persuade uh, Britain to write something for us. Mm-hmm. And I inherited that situation, And but it just so happened that I was in, in the seat where, in, where that persuasion had to come from. And so, uh, again, we invited him to lunch at the television centre and, and uh, tried to be persuasive. Did he need much persuading? And had he got an idea for an opera anyway? I think he, he probably had. As it turns out, uh, it's, it was um, unnecessary, really. I mean, um, the idea he had, or, or he, he described it, was, uh, um, would you like me to try and use the possibilities of television? And of course, that meant all, opened up all sorts, all sorts of possibilities. And I naturally said yes, and, and he said, oh, what, what you've got in mind? And he said, oh, he thought something with, with a sort of ghostly feeling and, and so on and so on. I said, I said, well, that's absolutely fine, of course. Why would I argue with him or debate with him? I would accept everything he, he wanted. And he said to me, yeah. how many French horns can I have? And I said, as many as you like. <laughs> and he said, that's not in the least helpful. <laughs> I wanted to be told. But had he... You'd done Billy Budd before? Billy uh, Budd and, Pe- and Peter Grimes. And Peter Grimes. Now, and, th- and, and more than that, uh, we, had done, uh, we had done the uh, church parables. Oh, yes. um, but some of those were done at Aldborough. Yes. The important thing about, the, about um, Billy Budd was that it, it used TC1 and TC3 uh, with Charles McCarris having to conduct the orchestra in a different studio. Just because it was a very big orchestra. Yeah. He wrote for a very big orchestra. He worked for Common Garden. Yes. Uh, and you couldn't put in, you know, the sort of sets that we needed together with a full-scale 110, I don't know how many members of the, or- the Ellis Air was yeah. at the time, but, yeah. uh, or the BBC Symphony, I think it was, how many, how many players there were. But, but certainly, I mean, in the, getting on to 100. 
Macarius found it very difficult, I think, didn't he, conduct because he couldn't see his soloists. Um, that's true, um, but he could see a monitor, but which is not, as we all know, it's not the same as looking at a soloist in the eye. No. I wonder if Britain would have accepted that. I mean, he uh, he conducted uh, uh, Owen Wingrave, I think, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Was he easy to deal with when he was? Oh no, I mean, uh, Owen Wingrave was. was was what in fact we came to, the, the one we commissioned. Uh, and uh, the studios were not big enough because he wouldn't accept the two studio situation, which uh, McCarris had done uh, and insisted that he must be able to see everybody at the same time. Um, and that meant that in the end we effectively built a temporary studio. This was at, at Alborough. At Alborough. Yes. Yes, I mean, with, with a lot of cameras. I, yeah. I, I can't remember how many OB units we had, but, yeah. um, but there were a lot of cameras. Yes. <laughs> how well received was it? Because it's uh, not a very approachable opera. opera. I, I mean, I don't think it was an unqualified it was success. It wasn't an immediate success, certainly. Yeah. And, and the, the effects which he devised uh, to, to be make it a, a television opera, which meant all kinds of a visual effect. We did as he wished, but in fact the studio, um, a theatrical producer in Covent Garden, could put it on perfectly well without any of those effects. Yeah. Now there was another thing that, uh, that I read about in your autobiography, which is the, uh, the appearance of Stravinsky at the Festival Hall. It was quite a coup to get him to uh, to come over and be televised, oh, I imagine. Oh, well, he, he, we didn't get him to come over. He was coming over anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, any concert promoter is going to be overjoyed if they can sell the television rights as well. I mean, um, so it wasn't, you didn't need persuasion on that. Uh, the person who did the persuasion would be would be the promoter who persuaded Stravinsky that it was good. And as it was, uh, he didn't, Stravinsky didn't, do the whole concert, he only did the second half. I, I turned up and sat in the front row in the circle, feeling sort of pleased with myself, um, and proud that uh, the, the network was there and so on. Um, and the first half was, was conducted, was not conducted by Sabinsky, but by Robert Kraft, who was his uh, supporter. And, um, and it was also one of these extremely austere pieces that Sabinsky wrote in his old age for about uh, five percussionists and a tin whistle. I mean, <laughs> I mean it was a very hard, sort of plinkety plonk so Yes. Uh, you didn't, you'll be hard put to, to be able to whistle it. Um, and, um, and of course, Kraft uh, was um, also a fairly austere chap. And the lights went down and I was preparing myself. This was the first half. Um, and, um, and a hush. Expecting hush as Robert Kraft came in and took a bow and so on, and lifted his baton. And we started off with this sort of a, just a, a single note from a flute and a tap on the drum and something. And we were obviously going in for, for a fairly testing piece. And uh, and then suddenly, uh, from somewhere up in the rafters, someone said, "All right, turn them on, Bill." And and to my astonishment, and, and I can't tell you shame, um, all the lights. In the in the festival hall, were turned on, and Kraft was continued continued conducting throughout this, and these these strange little tinkles and bangs on drums and so <laughs> on continued, and I I, I I remember I burst out in, into perspiration. I mean, I absolutely saturated. I thought, yes. what do we do now? And this convers absurd conversation went on between this chap and the rafters shouting someone down there. And eventually they turned, turned the lights off and that was that. And, and Kraft went on as though nothing had happened. But of course, and, and who can blame him? I mean, he was incandescent yes. with fury. Yes. Um, yes. And what had happened was that, was that uh, because for the second half, the, the, the first half we weren't taking, the second half was going to be uh, Firebird and Stravinsky was going to conduct them, and that was what we were going to transmit. Mm. So when it came to it, um, the lights were properly dimmed, and, and, and we set off on this. The first time that, that Stravinsky, I think, had ever been televised mm. or, or filmed, conducting one of his own pieces. Yes. And uh, I remember very well, because it's a fairly familiar score, which we all know, and, and, um, and there's a... Um, <laughs> 
a, a piece where, where a, a very prominent uh, French horn solo, mm. a very uh, key, a key point in the, in the composition. But just before, about a couple of bars before we got there, or perhaps a bit more than that, uh, Stravinsky cued Alan Civil, who was the first horn in the... Uh, to do his piece, and, and of course Alan Silver, being an extremely experienced court <laughs> player, took no notice at all. Um, and and Stravinsky then sort of went back to the standard stuff, and then when of course the right place came in, Alan <laughs> produced this call, and Stravinsky just, the faint flicker of a smile, and as he looked across the, to Alan saying, Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's on the film, that's on the yes, recording. Yes, yes, which is available on YouTube. Anyone yeah. can watch it. And it's very funny because uh, he, he got so many curtain calls that in the end he came on, came on with his overcoat on. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, and eventually said, I must go home. <laughs> um, I think you've done two Desert Island Discs. Is that right? I think You had one in 57. Yes, I've, I mean, I've certainly done it several times. Yes. Because you're very fond of Berlioz, I think. Well, the, my first Christmas on BBC Two, I was, uh, I think, appointed in October. So I had Christmas uh, as planning. So what are you going to put on Christmas mm. on BBC Two? I decided I produced a schedule for which I'm still quite proud. But the, but the, the mainstay mm. was the Enfance du Christ, which we were going to, which we put on uh, in uh, Ely Cathedral, con conducted by Colin. Uh, the Berlioz has certainly uh, indulged my taste for it, yes. but it was not particularly welcomed. The really? It wasn't was particularly. It? it wasn't a huge mass success. So your control of BBC Two, you also got Television Centre, which is a st an extraordinary, almost over-engineered piece of piece of architecture, isn't it? I mean, the studios were superb. Oh yes, it and, was, and, I mean, they were the, the finest television studios in the world, bar and, none. And tragic that you've only got three of them left now. Uh, yes, but the, the day of the complex electronic productions is over. Yes. Um, and that is no longer the style, the style has moved on. And what would you do with BBC One now that actually stretched it to the capabilities that it had? No such things exist. No. I mean, we used to produce a classic serial in which you took a dramatised version of great foreign novels and War and Peace and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and all those things. Um, and uh, the classic serial was a, a mainstay of, of BBC Two yes. drama in my, in my time. But theatre has kind of faded away, hasn't it, on television? Uh, and I remember a thing on BBC Two uh, when you used to do live drama at uh, 11 o'clock at night and there was a Tom Stoppard play about two lexicographers arguing about language. Wonderful. But the, the, the techniques of television production, both from the production's point of view but also from the actor's point of view, was utterly different from what it was from the West End. Yes. And West End stars didn't necessarily transfer onto television. They didn't. People who made the films knew about performing on television. Yes. But the drama that comes from a raised eyebrow was very much a television thing, even than the stage, certainly than the stage. So that the, the, the traditions and the standards of the theatre weren't at all really affected by what we were doing on, on, in, in television. Are there any other blockbusters that you want to recall? I mean, after you did Civilization, there was The Ascent of Man? Yes, and, and Alistair Cook's America. I then went on from having made Life on Earth. You know, there's a whole series. That, I think it would be true looking back to say that, that of course, animals are uniquely um, suited to that sort of treatment. They're colourful, they're very active, they're, or doing things that they're very easy to chop up into little pieces, if you wish, by me jumping and talking the recording of them. Well, well, what then happened, when they started, I was an administrator. Yeah. Um, and by the time uh, I, I decided that uh, I, was, I didn't want to go on administering, um, the, the, the format was established. Um, did we do another 12 part? Yes, we did. Well, after Life on Earth, there was... Uh, uh, living Planet, and yes. then uh, Trials of Life. And they were each 12 parters. Yes. And very successfully accompanied by books and so on, which you were able to 
uh, yes, presumably I mean, it was to, to a, contribute a, to, yeah. a, a marvellous opportunity. And I knew perfectly well, right after Bronowski, really, that natural history was the absolute winner on this, and perhaps the most suitable thing possible. And, um, uh, and my worry was that somebody else was going to do it, and I, how could I say no if, if, if it turned up on my desk? And so I decided one of the reasons why I decided to leave. And fortunately it was a success and so on, and, and I was able then to go on suggesting more things along similar lines. So, now there were two things that occurred to me when I was you know, contemplating doing this interview with you. One is that you span from the, the crudest possible television cameras to really the most extraordinary cameras that you, and techniques that you have today. You know, slow motion, computer-controlled rigs, huge close-ups, ability to film at night, all these things that, that, that developed during your time. Um, which do you think was the most exciting development, which suddenly gave you a breakthrough? Oh, dozens. I mean, speaking as a natural history producer, mm. I mean, the ability to slow things down, to see detail. The, thing, the ability to speed things up, to see tendencies. The ability to film after dark, huge. Uh, one of the most recent, uh, which has transformed natural history film broadcasting, is, um, is, is the um, ability to take a camera and put it in into um, a small uh, controlled radio controlled aircraft so that you could actually film things from the sky all the time. That is an extraordinary change, yes. changed natural history broadcasting hugely. And there was one, there was about one every two or three years. Yes, there was always something new. Yes, always. Yeah, and you yeah. always took full advantage of it. When you were controller two, you say you didn't really produce very much, but when you became director of programs, you had that written into your contract, didn't you, that you could yes, do some I, I programs? Said I would like to go away to do a production for take perhaps six weeks off to go yeah. to, to see what the new apparatus and uh, technical apparatus was capable of, so I could make proper decisions. Yeah. But you didn't enjoy. Um, being director of programs, I think. A uh, director of programs was a mugs game, really. I mean, uh, if you, if I had such freedom uh, when I was on working on BBC Two uh, to do what I wished, and I didn't wish Hugh Weldon or anybody else would tell me what my programs were to be about. So when I took that job, um, I felt I had to give that same freedom of action to the network controllers who were working under me. Which more did that leave me with? That left me with uh, accountancy, um, the, uh, finance, um, ma management relationships, yes. uh, management systems, uh, electronics, computers. That's not my field at all. No. So after I'd done it for five years, I packed it in. Well, you'd agreed to do it for five years, and that was, well, that I was did, it. Well, yes, I did it for yes. four, actually. Oh, did you? Mm. Right, OK. Now, You'd, you'd had a relationship with the NHU before you, before you left, but you hadn't actually worked for it at any time during your, your earlier career, had you? Well, not while I was in the BBC, no, no. Uh, but we worked very closely with one another. And uh, uh, the, I, I, was asked, I was offered the job of, of heading the Natural History Unit, yes. of being the first head, and I decided to stay in London instead. Yes. Uh, but uh, I always had the, the the most amicable relationships with um, uh, with the unit. It was it, it was always very amicable as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Now I want to ask you a question about authenticity when it comes to the uh, the filming you've been doing. Because I I mean I think you know what I see is what is what you saw and so on and so forth. But there is so much now in terms of CGI and all that sort of thing, blue screen work. But authenticity is very important to you, isn't it? Um, yes, it's not, as simple, it's not quite as simple as that, uh, but, but certainly veracity is what we're certainly keen on. Yes. There, there are some things you could only, only film if, if, you were, if you, as it were, set them up. I mean, um, how do you film a queen termite? Uh, you can't... It's, it's very difficult to do it in the field, if not impossible. Yes. But um, the ethics of natural history film broadcasting, uh, natural history filming, is is uh, uh, much written about, and uh, I've, I've produced my share. Yes. 
I think you always usually use a, a sort of do a, a ten minute making of, which follows your 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 programs. Or you always reveal how these the things ten, are done. The, the ten minute making of is an interesting genesis. In the early days of, of, of broadcasting, television planning operated on fifty minute modules because that was what the American program makers did, and the other 10 minutes was with commercials. Mm. Um, and so if you wanted to have a, a, a television serial or something, they were all in 50-minute blocks. Um, and so television uh, program planning worked on 50 minutes, uh, which was a very awkward time to yes. do. Um, but eventually the, the time came when the planners said, look, to hell with this, we ought to go back to viewing 60-minute blocks. Um, and so s- suddenly we were in the middle of, I don't know what we were in the middle of, we were in the middle of the second uh, of the 13-part series that I yes. made. Um, and uh, we were we had filmed two or three sit- um, programmes, and the, the edict came back from the planners, we are now going to want 60-minute programmes and not 50-minute programmes. Mm-hmm. And we got on our high horses and said, look, you can't, in the middle of this, we've written all these scripts, there are 50-minute scripts, not 60-minute scripts. If you want another 10 minutes program, it's going to cost you a lot more money, and we're going to have to do it specially, and one thing or another. And um, we can't adapt some of the scripts we have to make them into 60 minutes. So, one, so we put on our thinking caps, and then we said, why don't we hit, uh, make an additional 10 minute to show how they were made. That was how it happened, not because of any other reason of being passionate to be showing about the, the background of how the production unit ah, worked. Ah, I see. Well, they, I mean, people are very interested in, in how you do things, of course, but that served, that was very clever, really, because it gave you a 60-minute slot to fill for, for here, but also a 50 minutes for America or, or whatever. Yes. Yeah. How much do you still consider yourself a BBC person? Well, as much as the BBC itself feels it's a BBC person, oddly enough, I mean, uh, the Natural History Unit was encouraged by BBC management uh, to to sell its products elsewhere. Um, And so you had producers who would put up an idea, if the BBC didn't want them, then they encouraged them to go and look elsewhere. Mm. And that's what's happened. And I, I was part and parcel of those those agreements. And so I have actually uh, worked for programmes which are made by the unit but shown by um, other broadcasters. Yes, Sky, for, for example, I think, yes. But in your, in your bones, do you feel still part of the, the BBC family, as it were? Um, I would like to think so, yes, but the, the BBC, the separateness of the BBC has become muddied in my yes. view. Um, and uh, that's a great loss, particularly at the moment. I mean, if the BBC, if public service broadcasting disappeared, um, this country would be the poorer for it. I mean, very, very significantly Absolutely. the poorer for yeah. it, I think. No, quite so. And of course, it's now becoming more and more difficult to justify the license fee because of the way people stream things and so on. But no one has ever yet come up with a, a better thing than the license fee. I agree. So if you think the importance of mass communications like the broadcasting mm. in the political arena, um, the independence uh, is of crucial importance. And that's the argument that's about to be had. Yeah, no, that's, really, that's very good. David, I think it's been the most extraordinary privilege asking you these things. Okay. And I, I do hope you, you have yeah, found yeah. it too tiresome. <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> good. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>